Um, I think we can get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the BSAC Technology uh, Seminar this week. Uh, we're delighted to have Will Chu from Stanford uh, Material Science and Engineering Department. Um, so Will Chu is an associate professor at the Material Science and Engineering Department. He's also a senior fellow uh, of the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford University and a faculty scientist at Slack National Laboratory. Uh, he has a large group of about 30 uh, researchers tackling challenges of uh, decarbonizing various energy transformation pathways. He also co-directs Stanford Storage X Initiative uh, that builds academic and industrial partnerships to accelerate the electrification of transportation and the penetration of intermittent renewable electricity and energy, in energy systems. And this year, uh, he co-founded Mitra Chem to accelerate lab to fab for advanced materials. Uh, his background and training was in his academic training was all at Caltech. Um, in his did his bachelor's in applied physics and his master's and PhD uh, at the materials material science department there. He joined Stanford in 2012, and he has a lot of uh, awards uh, and honors. Uh, I'll list a few here. The most recent ones are the Humboldt Special Award, uh, MRS Outstanding Young Investigator Award, Volkswagen uh, Science Award, uh, as well as Sloan Research Fellowship and NSF Career Award. So um, in addition, in 2012, he was also listed as you know top 35 innovators under, under 35. So, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have you here, Will, and I'm very much looking forward to your talk. Oh, thank you so much for the kind invitation. Am I coming through okay? Yes. Perfect. Great. Um, so it's my uh, pleasure and honor to speak uh, to this community. And I think this is uh, perhaps a little bit different than what you are used to, but nonetheless, I hope you'll find it interesting. So today my talk is gonna be on how we use informatics uh, to forecasting and optimizing lithium ion batteries. So let me get started. Um, this work um, is really a collaboration between so many people at MIT, Stanford, Toyota, and so forth. And this is a center we call um, the Data Driven Design of Battery, D3BAT. And uh, it is a six year project in the making. And we have trained several dozens of uh, students and postdocs. And what I'm presenting here today is uh, representing all of their collective effort. So let me begin with a high level introduction. The grand challenge when it comes to lithium ion batteries is to control redox chemistry across many scales. So if you look at a cylindrical battery that's typically a few centimeters tall, uh, about 10 watt hour in energy. And as you zoom in further and further down to the micron scale and the atomic scale, you very quickly go down to the picowatt hour level. And the challenge here is really how do we understand and control all of this chemistry across this diverse uh, length scale? And it's not just the length scale, it's also the time scale. If you look at the length scale, we can start on the scale of a single atomic hop. So if you think about the migration of lithium from one atomic side to another, that's about a little bit less than one nanometer, and that occurs at about one picosecond. And as you go up in length and time scale, uh, you can go into the level of nanomaterials, which is in the nanometer to micron level. You can go to the level of devices. This would be microns to millimeter level. And then you can even go to systems like an electric vehicle. And if you think about the time scale, it goes from the picoseconds of a single lithium hop all the way to 10 years, which is the lifetime of a battery. And the approach we have developed here at Stanford and uh, around the world is to take synthesis manufacturing, characterization, and modeling, and try to develop a comprehensive understanding of how redox chemistry works across the levels of materials devices and systems. Uh, at Stanford, uh, I'm very fortunate to be leading a large initiative that connects faculty, students, postdoc, and staff across all of these scales. So this is just a glimpse of my faculty colleagues uh, who are working in the different parts of this diagram here. And we are organized uh, here uh, through the initiative. So let me begin 
by telling you about the battery value chain. The battery value chain starts with raw materials like lithium and nickel metal and so forth. And in order to turn it into a battery, it requires a number of steps. You have to synthesize the material, you have to manufacture the battery, you have to put it into a device like an electric vehicle, and then at the end of life, you also have to recycle it or reuse it. And what is very interesting here is that at each point of this value chain, you have to make decisions, either in the R&D setting or in the manufacturing and utilization setting. So these evaluation uh, is accompanied by optimization and decision making. And what I'm going to tell you today is that these decision makings are extremely resource intensive. Let me get into some details here. When it comes to batteries, there are five characteristics that makes the problem challenging. The design space for batteries is very large. It's a chemical device. You can think of it as a chemical plant packaged in a small bottle. So you have many elements, many parameters, usually several dozens that you have to consider. By design, batteries last a long time, typically at least 10 years for electric vehicle applications and 25 years for grid storage application. So the assessment time is also extremely long. Because they're chemical devices, they are highly variable. So this is in contrast to integrated circuits. And not only you have to think about the average behavior of the battery, you also have to think about the rare behavior. So you might have heard about recent recall from General Motors on their lithium ion battery for the Bolt electric vehicle. And then all in all, in order to navigate and optimize uh, giving these characteristic, the resource requirements are extremely high. And this is a $1 trillion industry. Um, in, in five years, it will be a $1 trillion industry. And a lot of the R&D efforts and money are spent to tackle these issues. So what are our goals here? Let me list them out. Our first goal is to be able to learn and optimize batteries across a large design space as quickly as possible. Next, we want to be able to predict outcomes in order to shorten the assessment time. We also need to be able to assess the variability over the device lifetime. We need to make predictions of rare events, especially if they deal with safety. And then finally, we have to balance experimental throughput with accuracy. And these goals led us to this particular work, which is how do we use informatics approaches to really speed up optimization of batteries. Let me give you the vintage point of different players in the value chain. So you could be, for example, a materials developer, making active material for the batteries, making electrolyte chemicals and so forth. So your design space is typically chemical compositions and how you process the material. And the design space is typically at least 30 parameters. So you can easily see this becomes a huge number in terms of the number of permutation you must explore. The opportunity here are that you can shorten the material discovery time, and you can also optimize the synthesis and scaling up. So this is the vintage point of a material supply. A second player in the value chain will be the cell manufacturer. So these are the folks who take the active material and assemble it into a working battery that goes into your electric vehicle, your computers, and your phones. And they have a similarly large design space but they deal with things that concerns manufacturing of the battery. And the opportunity here is you can decrease the manufacturing time and you can also predict the safety events statistically. And then finally, you could be a electric vehicle maker like Tesla, Ford, and GM. And there your design space is not the chemistry or the manufacturing, but rather the use cases. So you have to understand how to operate the battery. You have to train battery gauges and state of health predictors. You may even have to assess the value of the battery for recycling purposes. The design space here is a little bit smaller, but the opportunities are equally large. You could decrease the qualification time for new battery technology, which is typically one to three years right now. You can enhance your battery management system that goes on your car for controlling the battery. And you can also enable a reuse market as you take a battery at the end of their useful life. 
So this gives you a sense that everybody in the value chain would benefit from the ability to navigate and also optimize across large design spaces. So this is essentially a machine learning exercise, but I want to use this word carefully. Let me tell you what I mean by machine learning. The pipeline here begins with just identifying the design space and the objective. And just with any other informatics problem, we need some sort of a training data set. Uh, this will involve engineering the data set because batteries are governed by chemistry and physics. So we are able to incorporate data and model-driven featureization. Batteries are very amenable to parallel data collection, which means I can run hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of experiments at once. And after the training is done, we can use what's called active learning, which is to strategically explore and exploit design spaces. So the design space here might be chemical, it might be cell designs, it might be battery operating conditions. And we use our models that we have developed and featureized in order to achieve the goal as quickly as possible. As I alluded to, what makes batteries very interesting is that we are able to not only take a data-driven approach, but we're also able to take a model slash physics-based approach. And the two outcome we seek here are the ability to predict the outcome and also to establish a simple description of the design space. So both of this task will reduce the time it takes to make a prediction and also reduce the dimensionality of the design space I spoke about earlier. So for today, I'm going to walk you through several examples of how we do this with batteries and uh, some promising results on how we're able to accelerate. Before I do that, let me also give you one more technical slide. How you combine a data-driven model and a physics or a chemistry-based model is not simple. So here, I outline five different architectures for combining four things. A physics-based model, a machine learning model, which is a data-driven model, experimental data, and synthetic data. So these various diagrams here describe how we can combine these four elements to give us the pipeline. And I'll give you a few examples throughout my talk on how we're able to take the best of both worlds of data-driven and physics-driven models in order to achieve our goals. So in many sense, this is not your standard big data machine learning because in those fields, typically you rely heavily on the data-driven aspect. But here we recognize batteries are governed by physical laws and then we have to incorporate them as much as possible when interpreting our large data sets. So let's dive in. I wanna begin by describing the platforms we have developed over the past five years to achieve this pipeline. The first platform is integrated cradle to grave data streams. So what I mean by here is as the battery is made, as it is aged, as it reaches the end of life, we are collecting data every point along the way. This could be simple current voltage measurement. It could be more complex measurements. It even could be fancy measurement, for example, at the advanced light source of the Sanford synchrotron in which we use x-rays to characterize the system. And then we can also do post-mortem analysis. So having these large data set is the first platform. It's essential because this is where we're able to do the training of our models. The second platform is closed loop optimization. We not only want to make predictions, but we also want to be able to navigate the design space. So what I'm showing here is a workflow in which we start with battery data. We make predictions of what the outcome would be using early data. And then through a optimal uh, experimental design protocol, we're able to navigate a complex design space. So this is just a simple representation of a three parameter space. And the goal here is to select the right experiments and achieve the goal using as minimum resource as possible. And then we run this in the loop in order to achieve our final. This can also be extended beyond the R&D setting. So as I described it, this sounds like something you will do in the lab. 
But actually, this can also be performed on the cloud as well. So this is work uh, from my colleague, Dirk Sawyer, um, in RWTH Aachen, where they are using a cloud-based approach by taking data from batteries in active electric vehicles. So here, they're taking dynamic data from everyday vehicle usage and then doing the same approach of optimization on an iterative basis. So this approach has value both in the R&D setting and in the real life setting as well. The third platform is battery testing. So as I mentioned, um, batteries are easily manufactured in large numbers. So uh, we can, you know, um, the world manufactures um, well over uh, 100 million batteries a year. And we also have the ability to parallelize experimentation very easily. So what you're seeing here is a batteries informatics lab at Slack National Accelerator Lab, where we are aging and characterizing about 700 batteries simultaneously. So we're able to do large number of experiments very quickly, thanks to the ease of parallelization. The fourth um, and final platform uh, is data analysis. So these battery testing devices uh, generate a lot of data, typically on the order of one data point per second. We're measuring voltage, current, temperature. So when you start multiplying by the number of cells and the time it takes, we get a lot of data very quickly. Uh, so this can be very easily overwhelming. Uh, in collaboration with our colleagues at Toyota, we have developed a cloud-based system for automating data ingestion, data normalization, and also data analysis, all done on the cloud. So here we're taking experimental data, putting into a central platform, and then doing all the analysis on the fly as it goes. So with those four platforms, we are now able to approach this optimization problem using modern informatics. So let me give you a few examples of the problem we aim to solve. So the very first example I wanna give here is early prediction. So typically it takes several months to assess whether or not a battery is good enough for my purpose. It will be good to cut this down to a few days or even a few hours. That will represent substantial saving of the amount of time it takes to reach a decision for a certain battery. This data set here, which we have collected is about 500 million data points generated over about a year time. And it constitutes a bunch of batteries age under different conditions and to produce very different characteristics. So if I show you this data set, I would represent it by showing you the performance of the battery, which is typically recorded in the energy it contains over the number of cycles I aged the battery. So here we are using our aging conditions to deliberately vary the lifetime of the battery. So some batteries last only 100 recharge cycles, while other batteries last 3,000 recharge cycles. So where you're looking at the top here is the degradation of the battery capacity. So the coulombs is able to store as a function of the battery charging and discharging cycles. So the goal here is, can you look at the first tens or a hundred cycles and predict the performance at the end of life? So in other words, whether this particular battery is going to last a long time or a short time. So naturally we can zoom into the early life of the data. So that's the bottom plot. I'm showing the first 100 cycles. Uh, so this is zooming into the uh, left 10th of the data on top. The color code represents the lifetime of the battery. So red is very long lifetime. Blue is very short time. So you can see that just by glancing with naked eye, there doesn't seem to be a very strong trend in terms of the initial degradation. In fact, you can see that for the first 100 cycle, the battery capacity really isn't changing. In fact, if I show you the detailed analysis, you can see actually the capacity is increasing rather than decreasing. And when we do the full analysis, we find that the performance of the battery in the early cycles do not correlate well with its cycle life, which is the number of cycle it will last until it degrades to 80%. And then similarly, if you look at the slope, so the um, degradation rate at the early cycle, it also does not predict very well into the cycle of the battery. So in other words, degradation is mostly silent in the early cycle capacity loss. So the battery is 
degrading, but not in a way that can be made correlative to predict the outcome. So at first, this is quite discouraging because it hints to us that we are not able to save time by looking at the initial degradation trajectory. But we dug a little bit deeper. We said to ourselves, well, we have a lot more data than just the coulombs per cycle, but we can also look at the voltage variation per cycle amongst other things. And that's what we have done here. So we are now looking at the slight change in the battery's voltage characteristic as it is discharged between the 10th cycle and the 100th cycle. So plot on the left shows you how the voltage of the battery has evolved with age. So you can see that the capacity hasn't changed very much, just about 1%. But the voltage has changed quite a bit because the resistance of the battery has grown. So what we did was we computed the evolution of the voltage curves of the battery between the 10th and the 100th cycle. And very surprisingly, when we did this and we developed an automatic featureization of this green area, we're able to develop a purely data-driven model that can map the early cycle performance of the battery between the 10th and the 100th cycle and correlate that to the total lifetime. So the plot on the right shows you the predicted lifetime and the observed lifetime using our data-driven approach. You can see we're able to achieve an accuracy exceeding 90%. Again, I think this is quite exciting because it only takes about four days to run the test. Uh, to make this early prediction, while as the batteries will last uh, a lifetime on the order of three to six months. So this is a tremendous saving. And the reason we're able to look into this is by zooming into the voltage characteristic evolution rather than just the capacity evolution. Um, we're also able to do not only quantification, but also classification. Often for battery R&D, we're looking for thumbs up or thumbs down. So here we define the thumbs up as having a lifetime exceeding 550 cycles. And thumbs down means below 550. And what I'm showing here is the confusion matrix whereby we're able to very accurately sort just based on the first five cycle, which takes about 30 hours to obtain. We're able to take the first five cycles and immediately predict whether it's going to be above 550 or below 550. And this work, I think, is quite seminal in nature because prior to our work, it wasn't really thought as possible to accelerate the testing of battery, whether it's classification or prediction by this amount, which is basically an amount equal to 10 to 100x of time saving. And it doesn't stop here, right? We are not only able to predict the battery performance, but we're also able to predict the degradation mechanism. If you're a battery engineer, often you don't just want to know the performance. You also want to know how it is going to fail. And here, this is a demonstration of one of the hybridized approach I mentioned earlier, in which we have a machine learning model, and we put a sparse physics model inside the machine learning model. This is very popular because we don't understand all the physics in the battery, so we can't use a physics-based model to describe everything, but we can use it to describe something. And that's what I'm going to show you. What we have done here is to take battery degradation data and try to sort the degradation mechanism by looking at its voltage characteristics. So this is another data set that we have collected using batteries that's used in the Tesla Model 3 car and show that depending on how you age the battery, the degradation trajectory will look different, whether it decreases linearly with time, exponentially with time, or otherwise. And what I want to show you here is how we plug in the physics-based model. The physics-based model here we have used is the simplest possible model. It has basically two equations. It conserves the lithium mass between the two electrodes in the battery. So here I attempt to describe this schematically. As the battery degrades, what you're doing is you're moving the lithium back and forth between the two electrodes and you lose some lithium in the process, you also lose the electrodes in the process. And knowing how the electrodes match up will tell you a lot about the degradation mechanism. So we incorporated this extremely simple physics-based model just based on the conservation of lithium, and we're able to apply this to our data set. And we can now not only extract the degradation in performance, we're also able to extract the degradation modes. I don't have time to go into it, but the plot on the top 
shows you the similar data as I showed before, which is how the battery performance decreases as you cycle it. But the bottom row of plots shows you how the individual component of the battery degrades, the positive electrode, the negative electrode, and the lithium that is cycling between the two. So you can see in these three columns, the degradations are very different. And through this very simple hybrid physics and data-driven model, we're able to pinpoint the degradation modes. So hopefully these two examples will give you the, a sense of what we're able to do today. We're able to take just a few hours or tens of hours of data and predict how the battery is going to perform in the future. And then secondly, we are able to take um, the data and predict the degradation mechanism in addition to the performance. Now, let me give a second example. So now we have this early prediction capability. It would be nice to apply this to solve a problem. And this is the closed loop optimization I mentioned earlier, whereby we are incorporating this early predictor into an experimental design algorithm. So the algorithm here is exploring how we should be trying to perform experiment in a high dimensional space, okay? So I'm gonna give a very specific example here. We are taking a battery here and ask the question, how do we deliver a 10 minute rapid charging to 80% of the battery capacity? In other words, we are asking, how should we be flowing electrons into the battery such that it is charged under 10 minutes? There's actually infinite number of ways to do so. You can modulate the current versus time. You can, for example, have very high current initially, followed by low current. You can have very low current initially, followed by high current. The only constraint is that you reach 80% charge in 10 minutes. So this will be a substantial breakthrough for electric vehicles if we're able to charge batteries in the similar amount of time as we refill gasoline cars. So the goal here is to identify the statistically best 10 minute charging protocol, all the possible 200 permutations. So the figure on the left shows you the current profile. So that's how the current is modulated. So you can see we have many choices here. I divide it into five buckets and then we choose 200 discrete protocols based on these combinations. If we do a conventional grid search, which means we try every combination three times, it will require about 500,000 battery cycles in order to evaluate it. And if we assume a simple battery testing lab, this will take about two years to carry out. But if we combine this with our closed loop optimization, we don't have to do a grid search. We can do a snapshot of the design space, make predictions, and then iterate the experiment again in order to hone in on the best possible protocol. So let me show you what we're doing here. The top row shows you for each round of experimentation in which we perform 48 experiment each round, we are honing in on the part of the design space that gives us the reward, which is the best 10 minute charging protocol. The bottom row shows you the Bayesian inferred lifetime of the battery. So remember, we are not testing the battery to failure. We're only testing them for a few uh, tens of hours, and we're using our early prediction algorithm to predict what is going on. So as you can see from the left, in the first round, I have no knowledge of what's going on. So the parameter space is extremely flat. That's the bottom. And the top shows you that the algorithm is just randomly sampling the design space. But as you iterate the experiment, the um, optimal experimental design is focusing in on the sweet spot of the design space, which is in this sort of a left front corner you're seeing as you go from round one, two, three, and four. And then if you look at the bottom, the battery lifetime as estimated is also being updated to show you the sweet spot. So there's really you know, nothing very new here, but what was amazing to us was the performance. So we performed this experiment in real life, and it took us 16 days to perform this experiment. So we optimized across 200 permutations. A brute force grid search would have taken 600 days. So it's a 30x decrease in the resource required. And how do we do that? It's actually pretty simple. We made repetitions of measurements only when it mattered. 
So about half of the charging protocols were never explored. So that's 117, zero repetition, meaning we never looked at it. And about a quarter of the protocol was examined once and only three protocols were examined four times. So basically what we're doing here is repeat experiments when it is necessary and makes sense to do so and don't repeat experiments unnecessarily. And when you employ this all together, you have a 30X reduction in the time it takes to pick out a rapid charging protocol that can deliver the best performance out of the possible 200. And keep in mind, this is a very low dimensional space. The higher dimension space you go, the bigger the advantage of using this optimal experimental design approach. How well did we do? Um, we actually went ahead and did the full experiment by cycling the battery to failure. And the left plot shows you the true ranking of the top cycling protocols versus the estimated ranking. And you can see we got a few of them wrong, but we're not off too much. And the right is similar to the plot I showed earlier, which is the observed battery lifetime versus the predicted lifetime. There's a little bit of a bias, but all in all, uh, we are achieving very good predictions. So these validations are giving us hope that we have an opportunity to substantially decrease optimization tasks when it comes to batteries. Um, for the very final part of the talk, I'm gonna go a little bit deeper into physics and pose the following question. Can we actually learn something microscopic in the system? So these are more for um, perhaps those familiar with material science, chemistry, or physics. So in a lithium ion battery, one of the hardest things to measure is heterogeneity. You typically have about a trillion battery particles uh, in a double sized battery, and you really have no idea how the lithium is moving around in that battery. We can do a lot of measurements, but either you have time resolution or you have spatial resolution, but you don't have both. And in order for you to learn something about heterogeneity, you need to know, you need to have time and um, spatial resolution. So this experiment here shows you X-ray diffraction. So we're taking X-ray beams and we're recording how the lattice constants of the battery cathodes are changing as you cycle it. I'm not going to get into details here, but these data are very easy to collect. You can have a lab-based machine. You can go to a synchrotron. You can collect in a matter of hours. It's extremely standard, but there's no spatial resolution. But what we aim to see is we want to know how lithium is distributed. So what we have done here is we took this X-ray diffraction data, which has no spatial resolution, and we combined it with a snapshot and high resolution image that does not have time resolution. And we merged the two using a machine learning method. So here we're doing what's called sequential learning, whereby we first do a machine learning and then follow up with a physics-based model. So again, without going through details, what we have done here is taken the images, taken the diffraction patterns, and essentially simulate what kind of heterogeneity can properly explain this data. And we merge the images with the X-ray diffractions. So this essentially is trying to learn the heterogeneity from multiple data streams. So let me show you how we did. Again, I know this is not a battery um, audience, so I'll just show you schematically what is happening. This is the model that most people think happens in the battery. It's called a transport control model, whereby the insertion of lithium and the removal of lithium is controlled by diffusion inside the particle. So you see this core shell behavior. And when we ran it through our machine learning model, we found that the experiment data can only be partially explained. So we ask ourselves, well, what other heterogeneity can be more consistent with the data? So we solve this inverse problem. And it turns out that the model that correctly explains all experimental data is this one. This is what's called a reaction limited model or interface limited model. So you can see from the cartoon, they look extremely different. So in the previous cartoon, it was a core shell behavior of slow diffusion. And this is a mosaic model whereby you have this popcorn behavior of some particles getting lithiated and delithiated first. So this is something we're able to pull out of the machine learning by combining a data-driven method and a physics-based method 
where we are able to infer the heterogeneity in the battery electrode by combining two low fidelity data streams, X-ray diffraction, which has time resolution and a snapshot that has spatial resolution. And we merge the two using the physics space model. And you can actually extend this to a real battery. This is a simulation of a real battery using the parameters that we have uh, fitted. And you can see as a battery is charged and discharged, how heterogeneous the lithium distribution is. So this is something that we have been extremely excited about because now we're learning the physics of the system by combining a physics-based approach and a data-driven approach. So this brings to the end of my talk. Let me leave you with um, this slide, which again reiterates our approach of doing engineering of data streams using a data-driven and a model-driven approach and using active learning to strategically explore the design space. And if there's one thing you take away from my talk is that combining battery physics and modern informatics driven approach can significantly accelerate the battery innovation pipeline. And as I'll introduce earlier, we have actually taken this one step further and started a company. So Mitrochem is an advanced battery materials company. And what it aims to do is to integrate fundamental science, data, software, and manufacturing to create both incremental and exponential advances in battery cathode materials. So the schematic on the left, I think is a pretty good one that shows you we have to do everything, not just the machine learning, but also the manufacturing, the synthesis, the metrology. And uh, we are now uh, hiring uh, substantially for a 15,000 square feet Mountain View R&D Center. Uh, not too far from Stanford, we're hiring people across the board, battery experts, data scientists, process engineers. Uh, we just completed a $20 million Series A fundraise, and uh, we are open for business. So if you're uh, interested in applying your skill sets or learning more about how informatics can combine with the electrification, please come and visit us. With that, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to present. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much, Will, for a very interesting talk, a uh, very informative talk. Um, yeah, well, the stage is open for questions. This is a new field to me, so I have a lot of questions, but okay, I saw that Anju is unmuting herself. Why don't you start, Anju? Yeah, yeah thank you so much for the nice talk. Uh, I'm curious if you ran uh, the battery life estimate and degradation algorithms on multiple lithium ion chemistries or different uh, chemistries besides lithium ion and how well the observations hold. Andrew, that's a great question. So the answer is we are currently trying that. So in the machine learning field, this would be called transfer learning. So whether you're able to transfer the data, the model from one chemistry to another. Um, the short answer is, if the batteries have some similarity, there will be some degree of transferability, but how you normalize the data and what kind of physics do you encode to ensure transferability is gonna be important. So one thing I can tell you is that without a physics-based model, it's almost guaranteed not to be transferable. So you need to put in some amount of physics so you know the difference between battery A, battery B, and battery C so you can extrapolate. But this is a big deal because we don't want to do training experiment every time we do a new battery. Then that sort of defeats the point because it's upfront cost to collecting the training data. Ideally, we should be able to take the training data we have collected before and put it in in some normalized fashion into a new battery chemistry and then transfer the learning from the past. So this would be the front, this is the frontier of the field, how to enable model transferability between different chemistries. Wonderful, thank you so much. So I have another question. So the aging from your description, it sounds like it's only active. Is there a passive component to it just based on the passage of time or is it purely a function of cycle time? Absolutely, Alba, a very astute question. So the degradation modes has a time dependent component and a cycle dependent component. So you can think of cycling as equivalent to thermal stressing, right? So you have to put lithium in, you have to take lithium out. And so there is gonna be a cycle dependent mechanism. But there's also a time dependent mechanism in which the battery sitting there, it's going to degrade on its own. Um, so it's a mixture of both. So the results I have presented here emphasizes on cycle-based aging. 
but we're also doing the same kind of work with what we call calendar aging, which by we put the battery in a certain state and then we leave it there. And then we keep measuring it once every month or so to see how the battery has degraded. So a true degradation model has to explain things as a function of time and as a function of cycle. So give you some indication, an electric vehicle needs to run about 500 recharge cycles total and needs to last 10 years. So there is a calendar component to it and a cycle component to the warranty of the battery. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'm also curious. So you've shown us this really nice um, cell test setup with, I think you mentioned 700 uh, cells as the capability. Is there a giant, you know, battery test plant somewhere? I don't know. Does Tesla have like, um, uh, <laughs> like acres of testing area where this is being tested even at a greater scale? Or is this uh, kind of one of the greatest? Uh, um, it's one of the larger ones in academia. Um, the industry scale is about 10 to 20 times larger okay. because I mean, obviously their, their um, bottom line depends on battery testing. Right. Um, so companies like Tesla, Apple uh, have substantially larger amount of battery testing capacity, but they're usually more business driven. So they are trying to say, deliver a particular product, whereas our use is more R&D. So it's a little bit different. Yeah. But the good thing here is these battery testing equipment are manufactured in mass. So we're able to leverage the size of the industry in order to set up this parallelization capability. So LVNL also has quite a number of these battery testers on the hill as well. Okay. I have another question. Uh, have you also looked at temperature dependent testing? Sorry, um, which dependent? Temperature dependent, as in like testing at different temperatures, like it's extremely low and extremely high. Yes, very much so. Um, temperature dependent testing is actually the preferred way to um, accelerate the testing. So often we would assume that, you know, higher temperature lead to faster degradation uh, just from, uh, you know, erroneous chemical kinetics. Um, so typically you test at 20 C, 30 C, 40 C, 50 C. And the higher temperature you go, the faster the battery degrades, which actually makes the problem a little simpler. But yes, predicting the behavior of the battery at low temperature and high temperature is a crucial part of battery usage. Um, so that further increases the complexity of the experiment. That's why if you look at the photos I showed the battery life, there are these big refrigerators. So their purpose is to regulate the temperature of the battery. So I think, Andrew, you just correctly characterized the complexity of the problem is even more complex than I described here. And that's why an informatics-based approach is very much needed because, you know, as Alp mentioned, you need calendar aging, cycle aging, you need temperature. Um, there's so many things to consider. You have multiple chemistry. So this yeah. easily becomes a daunting problem. And my hypothesis, which is behind the founding of Mitrochem, is that people become very risk averse. They don't want to change anything because it's kind of magic. We got it to this point and it works well. Let's not touch it, uh, you know, unless it's, it's broken. So I think this approach will encourage people to explore more vicariously uh, and look at options they haven't tried because the cost of doing trials is now much lower, assisted by informatics. Yeah, certainly. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. If there are no other questions, let's thanks. Let's thank Will again for a really nice talk. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Alp, and I'm actually finished on time, so this is the yeah. record. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, and please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye. bye.